Okay, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, we continue our uh, lecture on uh, systemic functional linguistics and the register. Okay, related to the second chapter of your textbook. Uh, just before we continue, it would be I think it's nice if we could recapitulate. Okay, a few things about what we discussed last class. Now, let me ask you a few questions, okay, to help go quickly about that. Uh, so, we talked about systemic functional linguistics. So the main uh, linguist who introduced this is Mark Holiday. And now, concerning the title, so we have systemic functional linguistics. How could we recapitulate the definition of this kind of linguistics? <coughs> systemic. What does it mean, systemic? Yes, Brahim? Systemic means that uh, language is considered as a network of uh, systems. Yes, networks, <coughs> systems, choices for expressing meaning. And here comes the meaning of the word functional, in the sense that we use language for doing something, to do something, to perform functions. Hence the term uh, systemic, functional, Linguistics. These systems are organized, not random. For sure. They are organized, and we have seen an example of how, uh, many examples in fact, mm -hmm. about how this kind of linguistics explains language, okay? Yeah. So we, if you remember last time, I gave you the example of clauses, you saw, uh, declarative, interrogative, etc., and how they, are, they form a system, okay? Uh, yes. Now, uh, concerning... Uh, uh, functions, so we, that's uh, systemic function linguistics. Now, what, is, what are the main three types of functions or meta functions introduced last time? Yes, Nadia? Before we go into the contextual parameters, those are related to the contextual parameters, we are talking about meta functions. There are three. Sophia? Textual. So, what do we mean by? Uh, uh, ideational. So, what is the word you can get from there? Idea. So, yes. Yeah. Ideational. Yes. So, let me go. Uh, yes, Asma, can you recapitulate? It's about ideas, events, and functions. Yes, and also Okay. Okay, so, yes, it is concerned with things existing in the world to be real or imaginary. Uh, actions. Events and states uh, in this systemic function, of course, they refer to them as processes, and uh, here we are referring to the verbs. In in, in fact, uh, run, occur, etc., other types of words, verbs. Okay, so those, that's uh, uh, yes, additional. Yes. 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 <coughs> Part of the this we have also participants in the processes. So. Uh, if you take an example of a sentence, you have what we call as an action, okay? That's why we, uh, we have verbs, okay? But in systemic language, they refer to them as processes, a process, okay? And then these processes, they don't happen alone. These actions, in other words, using our traditional terminology, they don't happen alone. They happen via uh, what we call in traditional uh, terminology, nouns, uh, subjects. In this kind of systemic functional linguistics, they are referred to as participants. And we can have different types of participants. You remember the other few examples? Depending on the type of clause, depending on the type of process, depending on the type of action, right? So, and also the other thing we, can, we have, uh, participants are the circum circumstances, uh, traditionally referred to as adverbs, adverbs of place, time. So here you can have... Uh, uh, circumstances related to the how, circumstances related to the when, circumstances related to the where, right? And all this happens logical component, and that's uh, yes, each function depends on the other, they are interrelated, they can even over overlap together. So, hence the term systemic, hence the term systemic. There is a kind of system linking the things together. Concerning the interpersonal, Yes, uh, Naima. It has to do with the relationship between participants. Yes. Uh, both in written and 
Yes, the relationship between the participants in spoken or written, okay, text. And finally, we have the textual, okay, the construction of the text, how it is held together. And here, though, we talk about key terms such as cohesion, coherence, uh, okay, etc. Making references and so on and so forth, okay. And then we talked about uh, Nadia. The next terms we have introduced are field, tenor, and mode, and these are. Yes, so they are related to the another axis of this systemic functional linguistics, which is contextual parameters, okay? That is to say, aspects, uh, features, uh, characteristics related to the situation, related to the context. That's why they are called parameters, okay? And here we can have aspects, uh, features, characteristics in relation to field, in relation to tenor, in relation to mode. Uh, field, why? So, we are dealing with the why. Why the process, of the process, okay? Why? Uh, about what, okay? Uh, purpose of the interaction, in other words. What is it about, okay? And then the tenor, it is related to the home, okay? The relation between interactants in the text, okay? So, and finally, we have the mode. Uh, also, it is related to the how, okay, the language is organized, interaction, interactions, and uh, we can have different types of uh, written, okay, uh, texts, like we can have expository, persuasive, argumentative, and so on and so forth. Then we talked about register, okay, registers can be identified according to field and tenor and mode, okay, a configuration uh, of meanings, Okay, that are typically associated with a particular situational configuration of field, mode, and tenor. And last time, if you remember, I spoke and made it clear that register in systemic functional linguistics is wider, wider than that uh, introduced in sociolinguistics. Sociolinguistics is mainly dealing with one kind of configuration related to occupation, to job. But here we are talking about any type of configuration, okay? Not necessarily just to uh, occupational jobs, okay? And registers also, uh, they deal, we have different types of field, tenors, and modes related to each kind of uh, configuration or configurated register, okay? Uh, we have seen many examples, okay? And then we, uh, the other component we started talking about last time related to systemic functional linguistics is lexical grammar okay and here lexical grammar as you can see from the title yes lexis and grammar vocabulary lexicon on the one hand and grammar on the other hand okay and then we talk, we, we we talks about this kind of lecture biology lecture which we analyze in this example that you see now in terms of lexical grammar so we have the of course in relation to the lexis the older lexis into this kind of lecture is related to biology. It's not related to music or something else, right? And then we have the grammar. Grammar in okay, systemic functional linguistics is mainly what, what we're mainly talking about are the clauses. The different types of clauses reflecting different types of processes or actions or verbs. And then we talked about uh, relational processes and so on. So let me... Uh, uh, fine, so uh, I'm not going to go into a recap of that. I will go directly to the one where we stopped last time, so it was here, where, okay. Analysis based on systemic function linguistics of features related to field and the additional metafunction. Okay, metafunction. Metafunction, okay. So, uh, the, the kind of clause we were referring to here are called men, mental process clauses, okay? Mental process clauses. So, these are mental uh, related to thinking and related to verbs of thinking and verbs of feeling, okay? Verbs are examples of verbs we can have in this kind of category of clauses are think, uh, feel, okay? Believe, see, want, and like. As you can see from the meaning of these verbs, you can see that they all deal either with thinking, think, or even feel, you can, okay, believe, etc. 
or feeling. They may contain two participants. One of the things we noticed last time when we were going through the examples is that each kind of clause, each kind of process, we have participants, but the types of participants in each kind of clause or process are different from others. For example, in this kind of mental process clauses, the participants are either referred to as a sensor or a phenomenon. Okay? Example, I see my keys or I can't see my keys. So, sensor, you know, it's coming from the verb to sense. And here, sense, it comes from the verb, either feeling or thinking, okay? Uh, and then, the phenomenon, the phenomenon that you, you feel, the phenomenon that you think, okay? Idea. But what kind of idea is phenomenon? Referred to here as phenomenon. So, I can see my keys, I can't see my keys. And then the mental process itself, or the kind of action we have, which is uh, see here, okay? Let me, just to help you refresh your memories concerning the types of clause, I'm just going to go back to one kind of uh, clause in order to see the difference between mental process clauses and verbal here, which we saw last time, process clauses. So, pro verbal process clauses are processes of saying. We are dealing with verbs, in other words, that are related to saying, to telling. Okay? And examples of verbs we have here are uh, say or tell. The participants are either a sayer, okay, or a receiver, or a verbiage. You see? The kind of participants, the kind of appellations we are using to refer to participants in these kinds of verbal process clauses, they are either a sayer, normally not a sensor, not a phenomenon. They are referred to as a sayer, receiver, and verbiage. Example, uh, we call him parrot. We call him parrot. We call him parrot. So here we have the sayer. Let's say the person who says something. That's the participant. Referred to here as sayer. And you can see the kind of terminology we're using for systemic functional linguistics. And the process or the action itself, which is verbal process. And then the receiver. Okay. Him. He receives the action of saying. Okay. And then the verbiage. Okay. What? Referring to the what he says, okay? We call him what? We call him verbiage, okay? Or, sorry, parrot, referred to as verbiage. So this just to, okay, to help you uh, remember. So now, that's what we see now, mental processes. So we have different kind of actions, different kinds of participants related to mental, okay, processes. Eye, sensor, okay, mental process, and then the phenomenon. Another example. His outstanding personality impresses me. Okay? Impresses me. The first thing you should focus on all the times, verb. Then determine the kind of clause we have. So here we have a mental process, impresses. And of course, in order to describe the language, in order to describe the subjects, which we, the traditional terminology we are using, and the complement, we can use, refer to them as phenomenon or Sensor, okay, so here's our standard personality, phenomenon, and then sensor, okay. Here it is uh, reversed, not like the first one. The first one you have the sensor is the verb, okay. The person who senses, okay, and then what is sensed. What is sensed is referred to as the phenomenon, okay. It's like the agent and patient. Yes, that's right, agent and patient, but that's traditional terminology. Now what we are seeing is the kind of terminology, kinds of principles, kinds of aspects related to systemic functional linguistics. It's the kind of linguistics different and it has its own perspectives. Different from the one that is used in teaching grammar we have at university. Okay? And that's what I have been telling last time when I was introducing it last class. Uh, I was always, and still I'm doing that, whenever I want to explain something, I refer to the new, okay, terminology of systematics, of, but I, sometimes I use the traditional terminology. I, I say subject, I say verb, I say complement, I say object, and so on and so forth. Analysis based on systemic function and linguistics related to uh, field and additional uh, metafunction, again. Another kind of clause, existential process clauses, okay? Because they deal with the idea of existence, the action 
related to existence. And they are into usually one characteristic of these kinds of clauses that they are introduced by the empty category there. You know, there. Usually with the verb be. There is. Okay? That's this referred to as a kind of empty category. Uh, going back to syntax. Sorry. Contain only one participant. Because we have empty category there. There is. That's empty category. Okay? Doesn't refer to anything. But concerning the part, we have only one, and namely, that's the existent. Okay? Existential process. There is. There we have seen it's empty. And then we have the existent. There is a desk in the corner. And then the circumstance. Traditionally referred to as the adverb of place. Okay? So what we see here is that we are analyzing language using a different perspective, a different approach that relies mainly on functions. An, an approach, a theory that sees language as something we use to do something, to do things, okay, to perform functions. And it uses that perspective to introduce its own kind of terminology, its own kind of principles based on this main idea of functions. So that's why you see here existential process. Function of existing, idea of existing. And then referring to those who exist and where they exist, etc., it says we have an existent and then we have a circumstance. Okay. Then, behavioral process clauses, and these kinds of clauses, they are intermediate between material and mental. That is to say, it incorporates elements of both types of meaning. Okay, it incorporates, it includes elements, aspects of both types of meaning. That is to say, it includes elements related to material, and elements related to mental, okay? Material in the sense of action, an action. And then mental in the sense of uh, feeling or thinking. So for example, when you watch, when you listen, when you laugh, when you cry, that's a material, there is some material going on in there, material, we're using our terminology, which is action, okay? And this action, it's different, for example, when you take a window and then you break it. It doesn't include any meaning, any feeling, any mental process. You say watch, so when you are watching, of course, you can see people watching movies, romantic movies, and then the, in, the, in the plane, if you remember some women, romantic movies, and then start crying. Okay? Something that involves, okay, feeling. Listen, when you see people uh, going to concerts, so they enjoy it, and then they, they, they are happy, they start dancing, okay? So you have action in there, listen, and then at the same time it includes some mental process. Only one participant in behavioral process clauses, that is the behavior, okay? Only one participant, and that is referred to as the behavior. In other words, we're going to say the, okay, the agent. Right? So here this is referred to as the behavior. Although there may also be a behavior. Okay, of course, there should be a behavior. It's a process. Example. And let me uh, reiterate that you have all these examples in your books. He stared out of the window. Okay, he stared out of the window. She breathed a sign of relief. For example, this one. She breathed a sign of relief. So you have the behavior, the doer of the action, the one who does the action, and then you have the process, and then you have, again, behavior, and then the circumstance, okay? Yes, please. That's the, that's the way how they refer, because there is only one participant in this kind of 
close, okay? Because at the same time, if you look at the meaning of the sentence, she behaved, uh, breathed a sign of relief. So they don't say like a patient receiving the action. They just refer to it as a behavior in both of them, okay? That's the, the way how this uh, grammar works, okay? So only one participant in behavioral process closes. Let me give you a better example, taking the verbs which we have here as examples of material and mental meaning. If you look at, take the verb watch, how many participants do you think are watching when you are watching? You are the only one watching, right? If you are listening, I am listening to music. There can't be two participants. I am listening to music. Or they are listening to music. So one subject, one doer of action in these types of... Do you see it? For example, when you say, listen, you are the only one. By opposition to other actions, like Ahmed broke the window. Here, by nature, by logic, by meaning of the sentence of the action, there should be an agent and there should be a patient, receiver of the action. But in relation to these types of verbs, by nature, by meaning, by logic of these actions, there is only one participant. You see? I am watching. I'm not, <laughs> okay? To music. That's uh, not a behavior. That's a, uh, some, we can call it something else. Okay? It should be a behavior as well. Now we go on into uh, tenor and interpersonal metafunction. Metafunction, Meta yes, please help me if you notice any uh, metafunction. Thank you. Uh, so we are going to talk about person, modality, and mood. So the personal relationships involved, and we spoke last time when we talked about interpersonal, we are talking about, okay, personal relationships between the participants, okay? So the personal relationships involved in a text between writer and speaker and reader and listener, okay? So if you are going to text, okay? Uh, for example, if we go back to the small uh, uh, writing of the child in the textbook, he's talking about his favorite pet. So this is the kind of uh, sentences we have, okay? My favorite, he says, he's talking, he's uh, my favorite pet. We got him, we just call him, he can bite you, okay? So, what you can notice about these is that they are quite personalized, okay? Quite personalized, in the sense that he's referring to himself, okay? Absence of modal verbs, he can, but yes, absence of modal verbs, but you can have, you have a few, only one, he can bite you, okay? And he can say lots of words. Expressive or pirate's ability, not the writer's attitude, okay, uh, towards what he is saying. Okay. Okay, now other features related to this text, if you read again the text, okay, you are going to notice that the mood of the text, uh, impersonality is further enhanced, only declarative sentences, no interrogatives, and no imperatives. Okay? Now, mode and textual metafunction, cohesion, theme, thematic development. So, because here we are talking about text, okay? 
We are referring to cohesion and other features of text. So cohesion, the links between the... What do we mean by cohesion? It is the links between the clauses. Personal pronouns and the possessive pronouns he and he is to refer to the parrots. Okay? So what we are doing here is analyzing the texts we have using or relying on the idea of textual, okay, meta function. And we said that in texts we are dealing with these aspects as cohesion. How is cohesion okay, uh, achieved in the text you have in your hands is that personal pronouns and possessive pronouns, he and his, to refer to the parts. That's how there is cohesion. If there are no pronouns like this, there is no cohesion. You can feel that there is a kind of division. Cats. Theme and thematic development. How is theme achieved and developed in the text? How is thematic development achieved? Theme is the point of departure of a clause. What the clause is about. Okay, that's what you call a topic sentence. Okay. Thematic development refers to the pattern of themes across the stretch of text. And here we are talking about using our traditional uh, terminology of writing, developing sentences to develop that supportive theme, supportive details, okay? In order to elaborate, in order to develop the theme, okay? Now, if you go to the text again, that's what you're going to know. There is a theme. My favorite pet is a parrot. And then after that, there is thematic development, Okay? Thematic development in the sense that the child elaborates, gives more details about the part. He can beat you, he can whatever. He can sing, he can speak, whatever. Okay? So, this is a uh, mode in relation to textual meta function. Okay? Now we go on to conversation as register. So, concerning conversation, of course, when we are talking about conversation, we are talking about interaction. There is interaction. And this conversation or this interaction, there are two main things. Two main things. That's how the systemic functional linguistics analyzes conversation. According to this theory, there is what we refer to as giving and demanding. Giving and demanding. And that's clear from the terminology. You can see that we are talking about using language to do something, to perform action. Giving, demanding. So the speaker either gives something to the listener or demands something. That's generally, okay? Well, not we don't have the details, but that's what happens in all kind of interaction, all kind of conversation. The speaker is either giving something to the listener, like I'm doing now, or demanding something from the listener. Giving implies receiving, and demanding implies giving. Giving implies receiving. When I give something to somebody, I give. The other body receives. And then demanding implies giving. When somebody asks me something, demands something from me, I give. Okay? Or somebody else, he or she gives. What is given or demanded, sorry, or demanded, it could be an exchange of goods and services in general. Information, okay, services. Because when you say services, it's too general. Okay? So that's why, just one way to understand that in conversation, there is giving or demanding. And what could be given or demanded could be goods or services. Services, it includes a lot of, uh, okay, uh, aspects. Each of the speech, speech functions carries with it a desired response. Okay? And that's what you are going to notice when we go to class on this course. It's based on this theory approach of giving and taking, okay? That's why we have terms. We're going to talk about terms. Initiation, response, feedback. Initiation, response, feedback. 
So, response. So, uh, the kinds of uh, responses we can have, again, there are so many. So, you can notice, still, I always want to go back to this idea of function. Oh, everything, this theory, this approach is giving, um, providing us the tools it gives us, they are based on the notion that language, okay, has function, performs function. For example, here, concerning responses, we have offering, uh, implies, Accepting, if you offer, well, of course, positively. This is the positive uh, response, okay? We're going to see the negative responses. So, offering implies accepting. Commanding implies complying. This is the positive again side, okay? We're just referring to the responses which are positive. And then, stating implies acknowledging. When you state something, positive response you can get is to acknowledge. Yes, I agree with you. Okay? Then we're going to see the negative one. Uh, questioning implies answering. Right? Negative side. An offer may be rejected. A command may be refused. A command may be... Yes, repeated there. Let me correct this before we go on. So, okay. A command may be refused, and a question may be this claimed, okay? These uh, general okay kinds of responses you can have okay in a conversation okay now speech and writing okay so there are uh, characteristics related to speech features related to speech and there are other kinds of characteristics features related to writing so let's go to the first one. Linguistic features of spoken text. Now, the kinds of things you can have are phonological contractions and assimilations, okay? Hesitations, false starts and filled pauses, repetition, sentence fragments rather than complete sentences, right? Structured according to prosodic features rather than clauses. High incidence of discourse markers, like uh, happens to me when I, or any other person, teacher, lecturing. Uh, same thing happens in conversation or spoken discourse in general. Relatively or relatively frequent use of questions and imperatives. First and second person pronouns, I, you. Dexis, reference outside the text. Okay, this, that, there, when you are talking. So you are talking to somebody and then you refer to something outside of the context, okay? Not like in this brute written, we're going to see. In written, you should uh, refer to uh, what is in the text, in the paragraph, in the writing. You can't go outside. You can go outside in terms of history, but then uh, there should be a reference in the text. Concerning the linguistic features of written text, longer information units, complete clauses and sentences, Complex relations of coordination and subordination. Okay, people are at ease and of course can make really complex sentences. Okay, high incidence of attributive adjectives, wider range and more precise choice of vocabulary than in speech when you are writing. So you are at ease and you have time, so you can use complex vocabulary, metaphors, etc. The high degree of nominalizations, longer average word length. And finally, greater use of passive voice. Okay, so that's uh, for speech and writing. Okay. So lexical uh, density, lexical words by proportion to grammatical <laughs> words. You can, you know, last time uh, in the previous slide we talked about lexical grammar. So every spoken discourse, every written discourse, there are two elements. 
there is lexis, the vocabulary, and then there is the grammar. But here, they are talking about what is referred to as lexical density. Spoken discourse or written discourse, the lexical density differs from one kind of lexical, uh, yes, from one kind of spoken or written discourse to another. Okay? Lexical density. What do we mean by lexical density? It is lexical words by proportion to grammatical words. Grammatical aspects, you know, okay? The grammar. Okay? And here, they use a kind of formula for calculating that. But this is just to, uh, okay? A statistical measure of the relative frequency of lexical words and grammatical words in a stretch of text. That is the ratio of, lex you know, percentages, the story of percentages, okay? The ratio of lexical words to the total number of words. That's lexical density, okay? The total words divided, okay? So lexical words multiplied by 10, okay? Uh, sorry, by 100. Yes, formula. That's a kind of formula, kind of percentage, getting the percentage of the uh, lexical density. That's say how many lexical items are in there in relation to grammatical, okay, in relation to the grammar. Now here, uh, this course usually is this. If you want to analyze this course, that's what you are dealing with. You are dealing with calculating, you are dealing with uh, counting. You are units or words, depending on what you are dealing with, okay? You can deal with words, you can deal with units, okay? You can deal with clauses, okay? So that's the... Uh, uh, so this is... Uh, uh, and usually, in written discourse, usually you have a higher lexical density than spoken, okay? Discourse, because you can you include lots of... You have plenty of time to, to include vocabulary, right? Uh, okay, so now pedagogical implications. Anybody can help with pedagogical implications? Yeah, it's a very small section you have in the very end of your chapter. Yes, Rahma. Mm -hmm. Yes, functions. So that's the uh, why you can notice that in textbooks, Teaching grammar, there is a section related to functions, okay, requesting, okay, so that's one kind of application. That is the theory of systemic functional linguistics is existing in <coughs> pedagogy in general, and of course ELT in, in particular. So, so dealing or uh, teaching uh, functions, because it's considered that language is used to perform functions to do things, okay? Yes? Yes, uh, Sumia? Yes, so we are, you, are, you are referring to a very popular now, okay, popular approach, which is the communicative approach, where we rely on the teaching of or interaction. We focus on interaction, conversation, okay? So that's another implication. And this approach, of course, is uh, one of the main and still uh, leading approaches to teaching uh, in general, languages in general. Yes. Is it also uh, the notion of, uh, I mean, it can be also applied in ESP, in teaching ESP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The discourse, if we tend to differentiate discourse that is, uh, that, is uh, that can be used, for example, for business, uh, in contrast to the one that can be used yeah. in engineering. Yes. So, I mean, the way we design it, Syllabi that are uh, uh, that can be uh, used with each of these, for example, it depends on the discourse. So types of grammatical structures that can be used different uh, fields, yes. types of the language, types of vocabulary. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You are totally right in the sense that this uh, approach or holiday had a very major role and uh, influenced highly the uh, introduction and uh, the field of ESP. English for specific purposes. Yes, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm going to, uh, to, to, we are going to read it all together. So it shows that, and here we have the notion of register, right? And also the notion of contextual parameters, referring to the tone, tenor, mode, okay? So to the why, the how, and okay, uh, about what? And that's the ASP, 
Okay, when you are talking about English for specific, you are talking about English for different kinds of specific situations where you have different types of tenors, modes, and okay, uh, aspects of context, parameters, contextual parameters. Yes, that's right. So that's another uh, dimension whereby, uh, yes, context to, okay, referring to context in teaching, of course, uh, cultures, okay, and familiarizing students to different cultures, okay. The uh, five C's, one of them is the uh, culture, right? Yes. Yes. Yes? Mm -hmm. Good, that's fine. So, uh, so. Uh, Mark Halliday uh, has also always been uh, uh, concerned and uh, obsessed by applied issues, okay? Uh, so hence, that's why we have used language for to do something, applied, okay? To do something. So he has been uh, obsessed with that, so that's one characteristic of uh, this uh, uh, linguist. Uh, and his model in it together is referred to as a kind of applicable linguistics. Not like the armchair linguistic syntax, and, you know, the generative uh, linguistics, where the linguist is just sitting at home, uh, thinking uh, about examples from his mind or her mind, and then analyzing it uh, in his own way, outside of the context. So, Mark Holliday has always, and his theory, his approach, has been uh, referred to as applicable. Okay, yes, applicable, applicable, okay. Okay, it's, let's, let's keep it. Then, director of two influential curriculum projects in the UK. He wasn't just uh, uh, analyzing language, okay? He has one, public, one of his publications related to teaching. It's the, okay? we, I, when I, in the very beginning of the lecture, the first slide, I, I referred to them, okay? All his publications. And one of them is, is dealing with his theory in relation to uh, teaching and also uh, that's uh, one thing and also he was involved in uh, projects related to teaching and learning okay and which were successful like these ones in the UK uh, 1960s and early 1970s and they were successful where he applied his uh, notions okay so that's one kind of uh, pedagogical implication as well also he was a breakthrough to literacy at primary level and language in use for secondary schools Another way how he was involved with teaching. He was in the field, okay? Uh, to introduce his notions. So that, that's one aspect of pedagogical implications, right? Then we have uh, fundamental to this project was the concept of register, of course, okay? So he, it was introduced in teaching. So the need for the child to, uh, of course, to be taught because uh, one aspect we didn't focus on in this lecture is related to the first language acquisition. But what you could uh, remember about it in relation to systemic functional linguistics is that uh, the child, when acquiring a first language, doesn't acquire only the language, the structure, the form, but also tries to remember, of course, the functions, to, uh, to learn the functions for which we use the language and how we do that, okay? So all those types of parameters, uh, characteristics related to thinner, which we have seen, the child also acquires them. He doesn't only acquire that we have nouns, and we have, we have uh, verbs. He also acquires types of processes, clauses. So, so uh, and this is due to the fact that the, the child, there is a need to be taught the varieties of the language appropriate to different situations, okay? The range and use of its registers and the restricted languages. So the child, he also learns or acquires the different kinds of registers and configurations we can have in life, in context, okay, in conversation, spoken or written uh, discourse. So this is another pedagogical implication. And that's why he was involved, you know, in the previous slide, right now, I showed that he was involved in projects in schools, okay, 
where he uh, tried to defend his theory, okay, and to uh, include it to, uh, in the curricula, okay? Other kinds of uh, pedagogical implications are referring to, I, I have taken two uh, quotations, two extracts, this one. I give you some time to read it on your own. And here he is simply referring to the career, that's ESB, yes, and uh, application of including, yes, uh, registers, okay, into uh, curricula, okay, so, and this is the book I was referring to, the scientific side, linguistic sciences and language teaching, 1964. Halliday's theory was very influential in the Council of Europe's Common European Framework. Are you familiar with this Common European Framework? Yes, B1, to what you have in American Language Center, a Council of Language Center, yes, like a beginners, a pre elementary. This is one way of having a, calling the levels. But the Common European Framework, they usually call them like uh, using A1, A2, B1, B2, uh, C1, C2, etc. Okay, uh, that is a uh, different type of level. And his, this is the Common European, and each kind of uh, level in the Common European Framework, you can uh, Google this, and you will have a document, small document, whereby it states that for A1, a student to be considered as reaching A1, he has to be able to do these things in English. Or French, or and you have them in speaking, listening, writing, etc. And the same thing for A2, he has to be able to do this. If the, the student isn't able to do these things, he hasn't reached or she hasn't reached this uh, level. So, and in that common European framework, there is the notion of language used to perform, to do, fun to perform functions, to do. Okay, so. His model of acquisition underpins the basic theory of communicative language teaching. We are talking about interaction, okay? How this theory of register can be seen to underpin the de development of the English for specific purposes movement. So that's the quotation before, and also we have, okay? The concept of register is situated, uh, a situated variety of language. This is a very nice term, situated variety of language, okay? In, in, Engl in sociolinguistics, we use also the same term like varieties of language, okay, like for example in FAS, varieties, uh, you can have geographical varieties, you can have societal varieties, you can have different types of varieties, okay? So here we're talking about register as, or registers as different types of situated varieties of language. And this is very fundamental to the field of ESP, okay, needs analysis, and essential to ESP indeed can be seen as a form of register analysis. Uh, you have seen in the previous semester, uh, not the previous semester, yes, I think the previous semester, that's the semester two, in curriculum development, we should do uh, what is uh, called the needs analysis. Now, for people who are doing or teaching, uh, we have seen also another subject, you have studied uh, professional English and ESP. Uh, where they focus on this needs analysis, especially for ESP. ESP, if you are a trainer in a language center, or a language center working in language, so we have to do for, okay, is go, okay, and do a needs analysis, what these people in this kind of job need, okay? And then you give them, provide them with the kind of syllabus or curriculum uh, program that satisfies those needs, okay? You, so that's the... Uh, a general notion there. Uh, read this, please, the last quotation.
what is uh, the meaning here? Yes? Yes? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and has the, the, the significance of this needs analysis, okay? The needs analysis. Uh, and also, uh, not only uh, don't, uh, you shouldn't uh, think about this as simply related to English for specific purposes, but you can also have, gen you can have general English, different types of general English. You can have general English for children, general English for adolescents, teenagers, and general English for adults. And that's why if you look at the textbooks used for teaching these different segments of uh, society, they are completely different and they also go hand in hand with the specific needs of each category of age. Level and age. So those, yes. So that's, uh, and also the common European framework in the sense that even if you are an adult, you, could, you have different types of adults, okay? Uh, the level. That's another dimension of specific, okay, uh, English of type of English provided. You will have uh, English for uh, uh, beginner, English for elementary, pre-intermediate, and so on and so forth. Okay? So therefore, the notion of teaching a kind of whole English is something uh, uh, not realistic, not practical. So we need to provide uh, specific kinds of Englishes, in other words. How do they see language as a resource for making meanings? We have seen this throughout this lecture. And the acquisition of language is an interactive process through which the learner develops control okay develops control of the functions of language and the grammatical resources required for their realization. This model can be seen to be operating in the communicative approach to language teaching with its emphasis on the importance of interaction as both the means and goal of language teaching. Okay, so this is the, uh, the other kind of pedagogical implication uh, in the sense that in teaching English uh, there should be a kind of focus on the interaction, conversations, okay? Uh, and, uh, yes, uh, enhance the significance of the communicative approach to language teaching. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.